Uh, okay, back for, for the second half. Um, and I'm just going to... Uh, well, I think we'll go through the four speakers, one after the other, and then have questions and discussion at the end, and I can bring the speakers back in um, as appropriate, uh, rather than having a, a bit uh, stopping after every, every uh, speaker. Um, I'm going to start with David Weston, uh, Chief Executive of the Teacher Development Trust, uh, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, really delighted for, uh, to be co-organising this with uh, Teach First as well. Um, so I just, I've only got five minutes, so I just wanted to talk briefly about... Um, some of the research about what effective leaders do to raise attainment in schools and actually how that fits in with um, observation. Because I think the interesting thing when you look at Vivian Robinson's research from 2009 on what effective leaders do to raise attainment in their schools, then there are actually two things involving observation. The first one is in instructional support, and that's the very top-down approach, which is judging lessons and giving feedback and giving sort of lesson guidelines and this is the a standard approach that we use across this school um, maybe giving lectures to staff and getting everybody standardized and Robinson showed that that form of leadership activity does raise attainment and she put on it an effect size of 0.42 which is quite high however compare and contrast to another leadership dimension she looked at which was expanding the capacity of teachers to improve themselves um, and that's a very bottom-up approach, and that includes things like teachers peer observing each other, critiquing each other, um, co-observing uh, learning issues, using an inquiry approach where they're digging into the problem and understanding what's causing the learning issues and then building on those. Um, it's very much developing the capacity of teachers to teach what students need to learn, but doing it themselves. Now that bottom-up approach was twice as effective, and what is actually, I have to say it's a big claim, effect size of 0.84, exactly double that of instructional. Now I think in most schools we'd see probably 80% instructional leadership, um, if uh, possibly more than that, and then a very small amount of this bottom-up approach. And actually, clearly, school leaders should be flipping that over and saying the instructional leader, the instructional uh, leadership is important, but actually it should be much smaller in comparison to the um, encouraging the profession learning. Um, now, an inquiry approach, which I think lies at the heart of getting teachers to peer observe and improve each other, um, is a really powerful one. This is an example from uh, my charity's National Teacher Inquiry Network. And essentially what we're saying to teachers is collaboratively identify a learning issue, think about how you're going to evaluate the impact um, that your changes are having on learners, get a baseline to understand where you're starting from and if possible a group to compare to, and then go through an iterative process of digging into that learning issue finding the research on what is best, collaborating with each other, discussing, thinking, digging deep into the pedagogy. And after you've iterated that process, eventually you will come to a deeper understanding and you can show through your evaluation that you have improved the learning of students. Peer observation will be a key part of that. Um, now, at the heart of that process is lesson study, and I'm really passionate about this model as a co-observational teacher inquiry model, uh, which is right at the heart of the work that we do. Um, and it's, it's very simple, and it's this. Essentially, uh, you ask a triad of teachers to plan a series of activities in a lesson together. And for each of those activities, they then predict how do we think that element of teaching is going to uh, cause certain elements, certain aspects of learning. So they predict the reactions of usually three pupils, perhaps a low, medium and high prior attainment pupil as, as an example. Having made those predictions, which forces them to think, how does pedagogy link to learning? They then observe that lesson, but they are not observing the teacher and saying that's outstanding, good, requires improvement. They're simply saying, did the predictions that we make lead to the learning that we expected? They may talk to the pupils, they may have designed some assessments into that lesson to try and understand more of what's happening. But the really important part is the reflection that happens afterwards. Because then they're confronted by, well, from our understanding of learning, this activity should have led to that bit of learning. But actually, this student's needs were completely different to this student. Now, what we're finding, as uh, Professor Pete Dudley has found, who's um, one of the champions of this approach in, uh, in the UK, is that teachers are really confronted by having to dig right into their understanding of learning. And it really makes them understand each student as an individual. It really makes them understand different needs and understand how different types of teaching lead to different types of learning. So I think it's really powerful. But the point is, this is a very peer observation model. It's not a top-down model where you're making judgments. It's very developmental, but it's challenging. 
changing. So um, I, don't, I haven't got a long time to talk. If you want to find out a bit more, it's on our National Teacher Inquiry Network there or um, Professor Pete Dudley's uh, resources, lessonstudy.co.uk. Um, and if you want to get in touch, please do. I think, Sam, are we going to take a few questions after each speaker or just do all the speakers? OK, right. In that case, I'll hand over to uh, David Dido. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, I do. Um, okay, so uh, I haven't got any slides, and so we'll leave. I don't know who's going to turn them off. Um, so basically, I'm really interested in listening to someone like uh, Robert Coe, who, who says all these things about um, what the research tells us about, because it's because it fits it fits so it fits so precisely with my own kind of you know what, my own thinking that's evolved over the years. And and and, it, and it's but it's come from an, a separate route, which is quite interesting. So one of the things which has had a massive influence on my thinking has been the work of a, an American academic, called Robert Bjork, who's at UCLA, and he's a, he's in, he's he's fascinated by um, learning and forgetting and memory and things like that. And one of the things, and it really really struck me as something quite powerful when I first uh, read about it, was the idea that learning and performance are different. Learning and performance are not the same thing. And if we go and observe a lesson, what we see is performance. And from it, maybe we can infer some things about learning, but maybe not. And I really like um, Rob's use of the, 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 the phrase, poor proxies for learning. That's quite sexy. And, and, um, and, 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 and his list of those things abs absolutely are the sorts of things which we decide are learning, when in, in actual fact, I'm sure I'm not the only person here who's had an experience of teaching a lesson which I thought went brilliantly. And I patted myself on the back for doing all the right things. I've done my exit cards and a little bit of AFL and we've had our traffic lights. It's all gone spiffingly. And then, next lesson, they can't bloody remember anything I said to them. So what's happening there? I've also taught some lessons which have been horrible. And I've held my head in shame uh, presiding over something so dreadful. And the kids come back next week and they have remembered. <laughs> and, and one of the things which is fascinating is that there's an extremely poor correlation between performance during classroom activities and long-term retention and transfer of skills and knowledge. They don't correlate well at all. Uh, and, and even more difficult than that is the fact that actually performance gains, short-term performance gains, seem to, in some cases, actually prevent learning. So there's something quite interesting going here. And I, one of the things where that, that I, one of the things which I think is quite pernicious in our climate in the UK is the use in the Ofsted literature of the phrase rapid and sustained progress. And I think, I think you either have one or the other. You you're faced with the choice of either looking for rapid progress or sustained progress. You can't, have, you can't do something really, really, really quickly and it lasts a long time. You know, it's my contention. You might take issue with that and it'd be, I'm very happy to be uh, poo-pooed on that score. But if that's the case, and there's, lots, there's a huge body of research, and I wrote a blog which I've put on the timeline for this, which in advance of this, which links to a huge literature view that, that Bjork and Sandstrom put, put out in 2013, with about sort of linking to about 60, 70 different studies on, on, on these kinds of subjects. Um, and and if, this, if this huge weight of research on, on things like this is true, I think one of the things that we're faced with is the problem, the cult of the outstanding lesson, actually is retarding learning. It's getting in the way of kids' learning. So the more effort we put into the visible, here and now, tricks, gimmicks, whistles, all of that stuff, the more, the more we're devaluing long-term retention and transfer of skills and knowledge which is quite counterintuitive and uh, one of the reasons why I also love the gorilla. So sh I'm sorry you didn't show us the clip because it's a, it's, a it's a lovely clip. I often use it in training and, and it, it, I didn't see the gorilla when I first saw that clip. And the f I, I first saw it, um, a friend of mine had been on one of those courses where you, you either take the points or go on a driver re-education thing. And their point they were making in that was, we don't see motorcyclists and a lot of motorcyclists die because we think we'd see them, but we don't see them. And they, they used that video to make that point in, in that setting. So, 
what you know so so for me the big problem is if learning and performance are two different things and that maybe 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 sometimes we can infer learning from performance but actually often we can't one of the things that we should absolutely you know, the first thing that we should do is to make make sure people understand this difference that what you can see in a lesson the way students are performing is going to have very little impact on what they actually learn next week next month, next year. So, obviously, I completely agree with Rob, with Rob that the idea of learning is invisible. You can't see it. Certainly can't see it in the here and now of classroom activities. That's Graham Nuttall's phrase, which I really like. Um, another um, researcher from a completely independent route um, confirms this view. And um, if that's the case, you know, what, what I think what we need to do is we need to stop actually stop the whole of the process of having people come into lessons and downloading in some way their idea about what good looks like onto the person they're observing whether it's done in a judgmental way whether it's done in a formative way because probably probably you will be wrong not maybe if if there's such a poor correlation between performance and learning and, and sometimes what looks bad actually has a positive impact, then we do a lot better to not do that. I think one of the most fascinating models is the, of, for classroom observation is the one taken by Doug Lemov and the Uncommon Schools Network in America, uh, where what they did was completely driven by data. They wanted to find out what made effective teachers. So they looked at data and they found outliers, people who in tough schools got great results. And then they went to watch them to find out what they did, assuming maybe correctly, you could take issue with this, that what they did was probably good because they were getting such good results, and then trying to replicate that. So we'll, we'll have a look at what they did, and then we'll get other people to do the same thing. That seems to me a much better, if you're going to observe people, observe to find out what's good, then replicate it, rather than going through that process. And I wanted to ask a question when Robert was speaking, and I didn't really expect him to be able to answer this, that if somebody... If there's somebody out there, and, I'm, and I know there are, because I have people, like Rob, I have people contacting me regularly to tell me of their woes, that who has been told that they require improvement in some way, their job is on the line. If Tristram Hunt gets his way, oh my goodness. Um, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the evidence for the research on the efficacy of lesson observation is so poor, have you got a legal case? You know, sh sh we, we, one of the things I think we need to do as teachers is we need to step up and we need to reclaim our professional expertise. We need to insist in, um, in a much better quality conversation. And, uh, and that's basically it. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I do feel like, uh, you know, the, the odd one out. Um, but thanks very much. OK, going to hand over now to uh, Mary Myatt. Um, thank you then. Am I standing in the right place? Um, just to make it clear, I, I'm Mary Myatt. I'm a statistic of one. Uh, I don't speak for anyone apart from myself. Um, and uh, that my observations for um, the next five minutes or so um, come from uh, 20 odd years experience, which the last four or five have been involved in inspections. Um, I'm also very aware of the uh, extent and the limits um, of my own uh, efficacy and impact and they reside broadly in three areas. The first is uh, my own personal professional uh, practice uh, which I base on humility which isn't to say that it's always right which is why I'm able to say that. Um, in terms of the teams that I work with um, both uh, when I'm part of a team an inspection team or if I'm leading a team I make it very clear about what the uh, tone and the uh, principles on which we're conducting a team uh, inspection should be taking place um, and finally through my writing um, so that's the position I'm coming from uh, there are three points um, I want to make broadly tonight um, and the first um, is this um, that uh, we're sitting in a system of accountability and 88 billion pounds and rising um, of public money is going to have some kind of quality assurance sitting around it um, now, we can call that um, 
Ofsted, as it is at the moment. Uh, it is enshrined in law. The 2005 Education Act uh, is sitting, is where it's sitting. Uh, we can call it Ofsted. We can call it Moxted. We could call it FCUK Stead, whatever we call it, there is going to be some kind of structure which is basically looking at the fundamental question, are our children getting a reasonable or better deal? Um, so in terms of uh, my impact, I don't have the um, ear of Sir Michael Wilshaw. I'm sure he's very relieved to know that. Um, but um, I will come back to that because one of my concerns is um, that we're not just talking to one another. And I think uh, we're going to need some kind of um, agency to, to move this forward. I'll return to that in a moment. Um, see me a moment. The second point um, I, I want to make is around uh, the school inspection um, handbook. Um, it says quite clearly that um, inspectors have got to gather evidence um, on the quality of teaching and learning. Um, that's what we have to do. Um, and one of those things, out of a suite of indicators, um, is lesson observations. So the other things we're looking at is work scrutiny. Uh, we're talking to pupils um, and we're trying to gauge and gather an understanding of the extent to which um, they're engaged in their learning and the pupils' um, impressions of the typicality of the teaching that, that, that we're, um, we're seeing. And the key to the lesson, um, object, uh, lesson observations that we're going to do is to evaluate the quality of teaching and its contribution um, to learning. So we're looking for evidence of progress, and the key thing is that it's over time. So none of this nonsense about expecting to see progress every 10 minutes. Heaven knows where that came, came from. Um, it's over time, and that's generally over a key stage. Um, and in uh, so evidence of progress and gains and growth in knowledge. And we're looking to see whether there are high expectations, whether there's appropriate support and challenge, uh, what the indicators for behavior for learning might be, and whether individual strategies are there to meet um, individual needs. We're also looking to see, for instance, the extent to which literacy across the curriculum is being embedded or just tacked on. Um, and crucially, too, um, where appropriate spiritual, moral, social, and cultural evidence as well. Now, there's no way you're going to see all of that in a 20, 25-minute lesson observation, so we don't expect to. Okay. Now, one of the key things we're doing when we go into schools is to um, check how robust and secure a school's own self-evaluation is. There technically shouldn't be any surprises. And I tell you where there are surprises, it's where um, the schools and by and large senior leadership teams have um, aggregated a number of lesson observation judgments um, and, uh, and said, well, that's the quality of our teaching. And it's not been triangulated with the wider things that I've just described, including um, progress um, over time and students' achievement. Um, I was talking to my brother at the weekend um, who's um, a science teacher and the school had been in uh, graded um, three at the last inspection, uh, new head in, and he said, oh, well, um, the new head is saying that uh, all uh, lesson is now good or better. And I went and unpicked the, the, the data that, that was available to me and available to the public. And he's not actually right to say that because the progress um, for the people premium groups is actually low. So you've got to have this link between making sure that what we're seeing is actually triangulated with wider evidence, including the progress. Um, so my question is, is could the above of what I've just described be done as a paper exercise? Could it just be done as a data exercise, in which case we'd never lead to, need to leave our, our desks? And what I would argue is that data is queen um, and that it only becomes sufficiently, I don't want to put a hierarchy and bit, make a sexist comment about this, but if we're going to get it to be a king, it does have to have um, a wide range of um, further indicators behind it. And that's what creates the story. Um, so the data needs a story uh, behind it. I'll give you a very quick example. Um, 
one of the aspects of my work is that I analyze GCSE results um, for a local authority. I know um, that the top performing departments generally fall into two categories. Um, there are those where the students have achieved the, the top grades, um, VA, VA is looking terrific, and those students will have had the fear of God put into them. I'm looking at them from an RE point of view. Um, the, um, they're very keen to get the top grades. Um, they will have been um, prepared very well for the exam. Nothing wrong with any of those. Um, but then there'll be other schools with identical data where the experience is going to be uh, much richer, much more complex, much more uh, meaty and sustaining. Now, where would I want my own children to be? I mean, they're, they're older now. Um, I'd want them to be in that latter category where they're getting those results out of a, out of a um, much messier and more inclusive and uh, debatable process. Um, and that's really what we're, part of what we're going to look at. It's not just the final results. It's actually what's the quality of experience um, en route. Um, the third point I want to make is what would need to be in place of lesson observations. I mean, they are there in the handbook, and the handbook is sitting there as a result of the law. And so um, if I were to go into a school and find that there had been a really sophisticated, nuanced um, methodology for gathering the quality of evidence for the quality of teaching, which was beyond the cheap um, cheap tricks that are used in in a number of schools, not all, a lot of schools are doing this really well, um, along the lines of what David had just suggested. Um, it, it's two things, several things are going to follow from that. One is the, the quality of um, practice is likely to be good or better, and um, we're going to be invited in, okay? And so, you know, it's, um, it's possible to, I think, um, be much more sophisticated and nuanced and clever about this process within schools rather than terrorizing um, colleagues. I don't want to be made to feel a muppet. Um, I'm very happy to be challenged and anyone that I'm working with shouldn't be made to feel a muppet, whether it's a student or another colleague, but they should be in a context which has got high challenge and low threat. Um, and the best schools are, are managing to create that where the high stakesness of lesson observations have been taken um, away. Um, there are several, there are lots of, um, lots of people thinking about this and working this. I'm just going to give a few headlines because of time. Um, I mean, Dave has just given an extremely good example, the work that's being done through the, um, the N10, um, uh, organization. Um, there's Matt O'Leary, who is doing a lot of work, um, f primarily for the FE sector, but it's got implications for us as well. And the bottom line is he should, says it should be based on a collegiate inquiry. Um, my take of Hattie, might not be as nuanced as it might be, is that saying we ought to get out more. Um, Chris Moyes and others, um, there are others both on Twitter and, and here, who are looking at um, a much more formative, uh, discursive uh, way of looking at uh, improving practice. Um, we don't need to be bad to get better. Um, and uh, my own view on it is that we need to be inoculating ourselves, both through being um, videoed. I think the power of video is going to be the next big thing in, on this agenda, um, alongside the student perceptions, uh, which I think is probably one of the most interesting things to have come out from, from this evening. Um, not to be feared when it's properly constructed. We need to remember that, well, what we need to remember, I'm going to say, uh, that it's one of my research interests and that actually my conclusions from that is that the uh, we're in the black in the bank balance of goodwill from students including the roughy tufty and disaffected ones they actually want more uh, they, ex they th there's more goodwill towards us than uh, than um, anything to be feared so um, my uh, concern about this is are we talking to ourselves um, I don't have the ear of Michael Wilshaw. Maybe someone in this room or on Twitter sphere does. Um, I think that there are at least a couple of drivers uh, to open this conversation out. I think the work that the Heads Round Table are doing. Is anyone here from the Heads Round Table? Um, no, I think they were due to uh, Tom, Sherrington and co. I think the work that the Policy Exchange um, is doing. Um, but I think um, that it's up to us as um, Teachers, I count myself as a teacher. I always have a teaching project on the go. I might be an inspector, but I still, um, I'm still in the classroom. Uh, is that we've got to take ownership of this agenda? Um, 
And my final point is that we need to make um, a case which is compelling, uh, which is coherent, and which is collegiate, and to remember that the main thing, learning, is the main thing, and that, frankly, everything else is a footnote. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last, by no means least, uh, Dame Alison Peacock. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps with this new year on, I can come clean. I'm a head teacher of a primary school and I don't do lesson observations. I've been a head teacher for 11 years. And when I first went to uh, my school, it was a school in special measures. And what I would like to present is an alternative improvement agenda. The alternative improvement agenda is about an ongoing dialogue, which is about quality of learning, not just for the children, but also for the adults and for the whole community. If you can create an environment where anything feels like it's possible, then actually amazing things start to happen. And that's not about fine grading and levelling and judging and ranking. In my opinion, that is about having high quality conversations often at the end of the day, often kind of, you know, sitting on the desk, talking to each other about, you know, how did Daniel get on today? And was, was he able to, was he able to um, concentrate in the way that we thought about or, or what happened and what could we do differently? And that whole kind of professional dialogue that goes on. We, when we started uh, engaging in lesson study, which we, we started about mm, a year, 18 months ago, we found that that actually formalised something that we'd been doing informally for quite some time. And I w really would advocate that kind of uh, methodology that David was describing as a means of formalizing the process of really focusing on the needs of the children. But crucially, the reason our school improved so dramatically and has continued to improve, and we're now a teaching school and we work with over 60 schools as part of our alliance, the reason that's happened, I think, is because we've created a culture of trust where anything feels like it can, it can happen and it's about asking really deep questions. Now, when I was listening to Rob and he finished by talking about, you know, um, young people and young people's evaluation of what goes on in classrooms and how reliable that is, to me that's no surprise because if you had children here this evening from many primary schools up and down the country, they would be able to give you an incredibly coherent picture of their priorities for learning, that what works well in the classroom, times when they really have to think hard, times when they've gone home and they've wanted to carry on asking questions, times when they couldn't wait to come into school the next day because they were busy thinking about what they'd started thinking about yesterday. Those conversations are the ones that we miss a trick if we don't engage in. And I think the most important approach to school improvement has to be about how we create that culture with the adults and the children where we talk and we ask and we question and we think and it is messy and there aren't easy answers and you haven't got it all written down on a planning sheet. But the key thing is that kind of intangible sense of optimism and inquiry and energy and the desire to investigate that comes when a community works together to try to improve. And that's a lifelong process. So I think it's been incredibly refreshing to hear Rob say, perhaps we should have another, another way of looking at school improvement. I've been saying it for years, but only in a quiet little way as a one form entry primary head. Now perhaps we can blast it out. So Dame Alison Peacock says, I don't do lesson observations. And I really think um, we should have a, a massive debate across the profession about how we engage children, learners, in the way that we've described. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, really appreciate all the speakers today. Um, Rob, thank you very much for starting us off. Um, thank you very much, um, David and Mary and Alison. Um, I think, um, oh, thank you very much. Um, I think there's all sorts of uh, food for thought. Um, I mean, I think it's, it is interesting that when, um, when Robert initially put his comments out there, you know, I mean, it was sort of greeted by tosh and nonsense um, from a certain quarter, um, which is a shame because I think there's all sorts of interesting things. And one of the things um, I've, I've noticed, actually, Jonathan from Policy Exchange said, it's been a little bit like sitting in an evangelical church at times as people have been uh, sort of nodding and going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, as um, people have been talking about these things. And it really chimes personally with my experience as a teacher, like what actually feels developmental. And uh, just a, a small anecdote. Um, 
one of the processes we go through with schools in our network is we do a little audit and we talk to all sorts of teachers and in one quite well-known school that I shan't name we spoke to someone and said um, so to what extent do you try new things out in your lessons to what extent do you take risks and innovate and he, he thought for a minute and said no we don't do that at all not at all and I said you don't do it at all no I mean we've got these drop-in lesson observations and they're supposed to reduce the stress for us so we don't prepare basically you don't take risks because of course if you're a if you're a four you go straight on to capability and I just thought is that not outstandingly damning that that is going on in one school and therefore many schools that teachers are not taking risks they're not being creative because of this culture where one mistake from what you're being observed which is apparently not reliable causes you to stop taking making being creative stop innovating and I think that is just shocking so if nothing else happens from today I hope that that we sow the seed of the end of that sort of approach to uh, school leadership. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who's been watching on the live stream. Thank you very much, Leon, uh, for making this possible to live stream. This is um, uh, an event where we've actually had significantly more people watching online than we have in the room, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So thank you to everybody who's been watching as well. Please do keep the discussion going. Hashtag less knobs. Um, but let's let's keep this going. And I think you know there are some quite influential people in the room today. So I think the voices may well be heard. And um, I hope this is something that gains momentum. Thank you very much, Sam, for um, hosting us here at Teach First. One well, absolutely fantastic. I mean, how it, it was a mark of how interesting these uh, talks were that no one was turning around and looking at the view, uh, which is quite spectacular. Um, so look forward to speaking to you more. Uh, for the people here, let's um, have a little mingle and have a chat. Um, let's not go away before everyone's had a little chat to each other and be one of those things where, oh, I didn't meet you, I'm sorry. Um, we can do some questions, actually. Uh, are, are we allowed, Sam? Okay, all right. So we'll, we'll do a few questions then to finish off. Um, so, um, and if, it would be great if someone could have a look on Twitter and see if there are some questions from there as well. I'm actually just going to pass the microphone and then you can say your question and then we'll pass them to the relevant person. Uh, it's an observation more than a question, really, um, about the idea of, I think um, somebody mentioned campaign. Yay, let's have one. Um, two things about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I wear lots of hats. I, I wear my school governor hat. I think there's something really important about enabling governors to understand this. If you're a governor and you, I have a teaching background, most governors don't, the notion of a really simple one, two, three, four lesson judgments, we know who's good, who's not, it makes, I think it makes governors feel uh, very safe, that type of system. So we need to take governors with us in understanding uh, what it would mean to, to, to get rid of that and have a different approach. And in, in a similar vein, particularly if lots of people in the room are on Twitter, I think we all know that the way that n important nuanced debates get kind of ruined, um, not just because of the 140 characters thing, but because we we allow people to see us off at the past and I think one of the things that we need to get right in talking about this is being really clear about the distinct this isn't about rejecting accountability this is about the evidence about what delivers school improvement and improvement in learning outcomes and those two things are different and obviously they they connect particularly around observation but I know people will see us off at the past uh, on that one if we're not careful I just wanted to pick up something you said and what Dame Alice said and sort of quote a heroine of mine, this is Vera John Steiner, who's written about creative collaboration. Um, and, you know, she talks about, you know, you being so much more powerful when you're working with somebody than you could ever possibly be on your own, however good you are on your own, and that it requires trust and it's a very emotional business, which I think was your, was your point. And we have to, I think, grasp that. And what you said about your school seemed to me that it was actually a very trusting environment in which people could collaborate and be creative. And, yeah, and I think that's one of the main functions of senior leadership to achieve that environment. Because if you don't achieve that, you don't get any risk taking. And, you know, it's a pretty dull place to be and the learning is not very clever. Absolutely, thank you. It's also worth saying the research is very clear. Student outcomes, uh, student outcomes improve more with collaborative professional learning than individual professional learning. Research is clear on that. So, uh, more questions? Yes. Yeah, question for Mary Myatt. Um, you arrive at a school, and you ask, so you know, tell me about the quality of teaching in your school. And the head teacher says, I have not given one teacher a lesson grade 
for X number of years. It's all, you know, as just described by Dame Allison, what what happens then? What if you were to go out? Da evidence is great, data is great, but you go out and see a bunch of lessons which your team are grading as requires improvement. What happens next? Um, that's a great question. I I don't actually it, that, a that hasn't happened to me, and b I think it would be very unlikely that it would follow. If you've got that kind of high quality professional, it's basically assess high quality grounded assessment for learning for grown ups. Uh, which are ongoing, ongoing conversations about learning. Um, it's very unlikely that that would happen. We would still need to go and and ch and check and check though, um, because we're we're just looking to see is what the school's saying. Is it actually is insofar as we are human beings and we make mistakes, um, are we see, are we seeing a similar picture to what the school is saying? That's one of the reasons why we do joint lesson observations. That the the picture is is generally similar. So we've had three outstanding inspections and each time we've had a team in, we've had all the tracking data there, obviously you have to have all that there, but in terms of a, a file of lesson observations, we, the, the most recent uh, offset that we had was in May of last year and we had a file that included lots of lesson study um, conversations and they weren't graded, none of the observations were graded. The only ones that were graded were where we'd got trainee teachers with us and obviously they need to have a grade because they're working with the university and so on. And very quickly, the team who came in could, you know, we did do some joint observations, but they could see very quickly the quality of the learning experience that was going on. And crucially, the children themselves were incredibly articulate about what they were learning now and what they were learning next and why they were doing it. And that it was that articulacy from the children as well as seeing, you know, the lesson as you would expect to see it. And, and I completely take the point from Rob Coe. They probably were all the proxies that we, we tend to see in place you know, in, in terms of what stands for a, a good lesson. I'm sure they were all there, but it's also backed up by that inquiry that, that is much more deep rooted. So both those together, plus the data, enable the judgment. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yes. Thanks, David. Um, I just, this might be for Rob as well, but I mean, having worked with lesson study for about 12 years, I don't think that it would be very likely that we would ever get to a stage where you would get very consistent observations about children's learning in a classroom because classrooms are so complex. I mean, Rob, you said it's invisible. We're hypothesizing about what might happen in a lesson. There are 30 different things that are all going in very different ways. Um, what I think you do get through that kind of close observation of children's learning is a better understanding about glimpses of that learning taking place, which enables you to respond more effectively next time. And, and, and it's happening again in my, in my latest piece of work. The, the thing that happens again and again, nine times out of ten, is that you will pick your three case pupils and by the end of that first research lesson you'll discover that the assessment that you've had of that pupil for years as a school, as an individual, was completely wrong. And that just happens so regularly. That's a third of all the, our knowledge of pupils uh, over many, many, many studies um, is, is very unreliable. So I don't think we'll ever get reliable, but I do think we'll get better at understanding what to do to help children learn. Thank you, Pete. Uh, any other questions? Do we have any questions from Twitter? Anyone who's monitoring it? Someone who's monitoring the Twitter hashtag? Yeah, could you? So a question from Mike Bostock. Does it matter that there's a huge variation in how well schools make use of performance data? Um, interesting one. I don't know who we're going to make. David, how would you like to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> does it matter? Yes. Yes, it does matter. Okay, no. yeah. um, yes, it does. And um, again, making the point that it's, it's it's uh, not the king, it's the queen. Um, but the real concern is uh, when you've got pockets of uh, groups of children who are not necessarily making the same progress as um, either the rest of the cohort or against national measures. And it's a real concern, actually, every now and then, it's not often, uh, you go into a school which is a data desert 
um, and that they have not got the information that they need to be able to um, move youngsters on. Uh, one of the things we look at before we go in um, and and do an inspection and that a lead would analyze um, are the um, rates of progress uh, which we've got information on for uh, English and maths. Um, and it always raises questions for me if the children coming in set level five um, are not making expected levels of progress. Same something about the quality of experience there, which we're going to want to ask some questions about. So the data is really important, but it has to be used with a light touch. It mustn't be, um, it mustn't define an individual. I never want to hear a child saying, I'm a level four. No, you're not. You're a human being. Um, and uh, similarly, oh, I'm only good. My less, you know, your aspects, your lesson were good. So this translation of the data to the human being is absolutely criminal and absolutely needs to stop. So yeah, it's about being really commonsensical about it, that, and using it to drive sensible movement forward. Um, I, I'd probably add to that as well. I think you see in schools, um, again, top down and bottom up uses of data. Um, so I think, uh, for example, we often see where teachers, I just have to type something in and then the senior leaders then do all the analysis for that and hand down a judgment and then say, I have seen this, you are not doing well enough. Whereas I think when you see the schools who are using it well, the teachers themselves are collecting gathering an interpretation of that data, passing it up through um, to senior leaders through conversation and discussion, and they talk together about how they can improve it. And those teachers are using it in a very granular way about small bits of learning to really understand the small pieces of learning and how they can help move that forward. And I think that's really different from what progress have you made against your FFT targets or you know how many have you made your, uh, your two levels of progress. Uh, really, really different, and I think you see two different things there. Rob, did you want to say something on that? I don't know how to comment to that. Um, to those, both those questions, actually. So yes, I think it, it matters almost more than anything uh, how people use data, what they understand about assessment, because you know assessment varies a lot in its quality and and the kinds of inferences that can be supported by it. How's that assessment been done, and so on? And there's there's massive room for improvement there in very many schools, I think. And just to comment on, on Pete's um, observation there that different observers may not agree, well, that may not matter at all. It depends what you want to use the observation for. You know, and the lesson study context is one where different insights all contribute. So that's fine. If you don't want to use lesson observation for grading, then it, it may not matter at all that different people do see different things. But if you do want to use it for grading, then it matters a lot. Yeah, it's a strength. Yeah. Okay. Do we have uh, some more questions from uh, from? Uh, oh, let's go over here. Then another one on Twitter. So yes. Um, uh, as a, a school governor um, with responsibility for, I hate to say it, pay and appraisal policies, how confident can I be in the assessments of um, teachers? <laughs> Yeah. Rob, that sounds like one for you. Yeah, well, you are. Yeah, absolutely. You should be worried, I think. Well, I think it comes back to that question about the interpretation of data. You know, pe people should be. Da data is, is an important part of making those judgments, if their judgments have to be made. But that requires that people are able to cope with that, that they, that they take the view, for example, that if I have two bits of information that don't agree, I'm better off than if I just had one. Now, most people don't think that. They like to have just one because it's simpler. But actually, they're wrong. They're better off with two, even though they don't agree. So, and that's about partly about the sophistication of understanding and use of data. So, so there is a problem there, but it comes down ultimately to judgment. Judgment should be informed by data, but judgment shouldn't be made by data. Okay, so you don't make the judgment yourself. So there needs to be a process and there needs to be the capabilities for people involved to make that judgment well, I think. I think part of the problem is that it's all data. Everything, everything we make a judgment on is data of one kind or another. And that you know, learning is always invisible, but a much better proxy of learning might be an exam rather than what happens in a classroom. So I'd rather go with that data rather than make it, you know, base it on anything 
that that I see and 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 are fooled into thinking is good when actually what well, you know I'm probably wrong. Yeah. So it's um, you know I'm I'm thinking very recently we were told that uh, you know one hundred percent of teaching in my school is good or better. How confident? No, but that's a nonsense. But I mean I think that you know that what what happens that the thing. The thing, the thing that get, the thing that, that's the problem is is where where these judgments are actually are actually used to contradict the data. So you've got the you know the crusty old bugger who's been teaching for 30 years and you know does everything that you know that we, they're not supposed to according to you know, sort of trendy ideas about what we should be doing. They get great results and yet people go in and judge them as requiring improvement, try and change them. You know, and that's that's where it's shocking. Um, it's worth just saying, uh, we recently went up to Cramlington Learning Village, who have, a, a, again, an amazing reputation for uh, professional learning. And interestingly, the, uh, the deputy head there said that in their last uh, Ofsted, when talking about the quality of CPD, um, he brought his huge folders of, like, here's all the peer observation that we've been doing, here's the practitioner research, the master's level, and so on. And the Ofsted inspector actually said to him, I don't want to know that. Give me a couple of bits of paper. I want to know the grades your teachers are on now, the actions you're planning to deal with them, and then how you're monitoring how those grades are improving. That's all I want to see. So I'm just reflecting that. And that might be, that might be different, uh, different, different inspectors. I mean, they still got outstanding. Um, but I'm just saying, you know, people, that, that is happening. And, and that's, you know, for a school who, again, they're very much, they're not into their graded lesson observations. But for them, it's like, oh, OK, well, maybe we have to do that. So y you are working against that background. Can we just take, there was another uh, question from Twitter, was there? I wanted to know how many teachers were in your school, Alison, and what the turnover was. There was, uh, and I guess what's behind that question is, did I sack everybody at the beginning when the school was in special measures? And the reality is there was one teacher who, um, after nine months of trying to work with her, it was quite clear she didn't like children. And for me, that is a fundamental flaw uh, in um, a relationship with a class, and, and she left. Um, encouraged to leave by me um, but the rest of the staff stayed and some of them subsequently went on to take on advisory roles so it wasn't that uh, it wasn't that everybody left and we just started afresh so um, hopefully that answers the question um, okay right sorry we had some more questions over here uh, Loic um, so we've got we've talked about those kind of extreme cases of schools where one one bad observation in your own capability or whatever and we've talked about the uh, dame allison's model of something really solid and and interesting and so on but isn't there also a kind of middle ground which is that actually a lot of the time when a school decides from observation that a teacher's underperforming and so on it's actually not one of those cases of just one one observation or whatever it's actually about multiple observers <laughs> and uh, and some consistency so it tends to be when you've I mean, in, in some r relatively decent schools, you have got several people coming in observing, external people coming in observing, and action starts to be taken once that there's a consistent judgment. Can you say something, uh, probably, Robert, about about what you think of those those kind of cases? Yeah, I think that's right. I think the challenge is to differentiate between the the kind of flaky one-off judgments that wouldn't be replicated. And, and the judgments that are likely to be sounder because they come from multiple sources, because they come from better sources, um, they're, they're better judgments. So it comes down to understanding the quality of, of different evidence and, and using that effectively to make good judgments. You know, that's all there is to it, if you like, and yet that's the hardest thing in the world. So yeah, I agree. I, I, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm not against observation. I hope nobody's hearing me saying that. I think we should do observation. I just think we should do it better. Um, I'm, I'm in favour of data. I'm in favour of assessment. I'm in favour of, of collecting student ratings and parent ratings and and peer ratings and and all the kinds of ratings we can, and and then using judgment to to come up with um, interpretations of all that different stuff. But that's a really really hard thing to do. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, we'll just take uh, probably one or two more questions if we have any or from Twitter. Has anyone else spotted any other questions or have we tired out the Twitter sphere? Um, okay.
Appear to tired out everybody. Okay. Well, so listen, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again to Sam for hosting, to all the speakers. Thank you to the audience. Please do mingle and have a chat and keep tweeting less knobs and let's see where we go from here. Thank you.